All right, thanks for watching. And today I wanna to show something really neat. Namely, if you have a continuous function on the closed interval a comma b, then it's uniformly continuous, which gives us a very nice test, if you want, of, for uniform continuity. So in fact, if you have a function f from a to b to r is continuous, then f is uniformly continuous f is uniformly continuous. For instance, consider an example I've already done. So consider f of x equals x squared on the interval minus 1 comma 3. Well, this function is continuous we actually get that f in this case is uniformly continuous. So you see, I did waste your time with the previous video, so because you can just do this in uh, two lines if you want. Um, that said, a couple of remarks. So um, on the one hand, it's important that this is the closed interval. This would not be true for the open interval. And on the other hand, it turns out the only things I'll use here is that this is closed and this is bounded. So you may have guessed it, but the same proof also works for any compact set. I know, scary terms. But now let's prove this actually pretty quick proof in my opinion. So proof, so step one, suppose not. So suppose it's not uniformly continuous. Therefore, what this means is there is some pesky epsilon such that for all delta, there are there's there are a counterexamples x and y in a comma b that are delta close but whose outputs are at least epsilon apart uh, such that uh, x minus y is less than delta but f of x minus f of y is greater or equal to epsilon. All right and here's the thing so again epsilon is fixed it's this fixed number and the point is as usual since it's true for all delta it must be true for all stuff of 1 over m so so that we can go from numbers to actually sequences so in particular for all n natural numbers there are numbers so xn and yn and yn in the interval a comma b such that they're at least uh, at most uh, 1 over n apart so xn minus yn is less than so delta which here is 1 over n but the outputs are at least epsilon apart so f of xn and f of yn is greater or equal to epsilon all right, now let's look at the sequence xn. So maybe step two. Well, the sequence xn is a sequence in a comma b. Maybe somewhere here. So because it's in a comma b and this interval is bounded, we actually get that the sequence xn is bounded. So xn is bounded. And well, since we have a bounded sequence of real numbers, for the last time in this course, Bolzano Weierstrasse, and then we get the following. So by the Bolzano Weierstrasse theorem, we know that there is a convergent subsequence.
x and k that goes to some x naught. Okay. So here we have this sequence xn, and from this we can extract some convergent subsequence x and k that goes to some x naught. Now, in general, the limit doesn't have to be in the interval, but remember it's a closed interval. So since AB is closed, we actually get that X naught is an AB, and this will be important. And therefore, well, again, X and K is a nice sequence. So look now at one of our other inequalities. So step three. Look at one thing we had. We had xn minus yn. That's less than 1 over n. So in particular, this is true for the subsequence. So x and k minus y and k is less than 1 over n k. But this means those two sequences, they're very close together. And basically, since this goes to x naught, it implies that this goes to x naught. But let me prove this as a separate claim. So claim, we get that y and k goes to x naught. And here's the proof. I know we have an epsilon before, but let's just let epsilon be greater than zero. Just, I don't want to write epsilon primes or anything. So let epsilon be zero be given. Then the point is, since x and k goes to x naught, well, eventually they're close together. So since x and k goes to x naught, we know that there is capital K such that if k is bigger than capital K, then the difference x and k minus x naught is less than epsilon over 2, because we have two terms. And moreover, if you choose k even bigger, such that this becomes less than epsilon over 2, then if um, capital K is even bigger, such that if you want 1 over nk, is less than epsilon over 2, then then now let's look at the difference. So we had again y and k minus x naught. We want to show this is less than epsilon, but this is less than or equal to y and k minus x and k plus um, x and k minus x naught. But we know this is less than 1 over nk, and this is less than epsilon over 2. But now we chose 1 over nk to be less than epsilon over 2, and therefore at the end we get epsilon. So in fact, uh, y and k also goes to x naught, and that's a problem. So I think step 4. You see, since x and k goes to x naught, we get f of x and k goes to f of x naught because f is continuous. So we never used this so far. And similarly, y and k goes to x naught. That implies f of y and k goes to f of x naught. But then look at the difference. So there's one thing we haven't used yet. We haven't used the fact that f of xn minus f of yn is greater or equal to epsilon. So in particular with the subsequence, f of x and k minus f of y and k is greater or equal to epsilon. But the point is, if you let k go to infinity, we then don't get that f of x naught this goes to f of x naught, this goes to f of x naught, is greater or equal to epsilon. So 0 is greater or equal to epsilon, which is positive. And that's a contradiction, because we can't have both things. All right, uh, and therefore this has been proven, and thank you very much.